Hello everyone and welcome to this week's portrait painting demonstration. My name is Yupari and this week we're going to be painting an Alaprima portrait from life. I'd like to give a special thanks to the artist Karen Warshall for allowing me to film in her studio. I'll have a link to her website in the description below and I'll have some sample images of her work at the end of this video. So let's get to it. Whenever you start an Ala Prima portrait painting from life, you really want to tell yourself early on what the model is doing. So you want to take note of the turn and the tilt that the model is making with respect to you. So you want to know, is she tilting? Is she or he tilting? Are they turning? And how much are they tilting or turning relative to you? Before I start, I actually try to walk around the room and see what the model looks like in different vantage points and remind myself what exactly the model is doing, what tip, what turn, and what angle is the model making with respect to your view. This is especially important early on in an Ala Prima portrait painting because models are human beings and they tend to move. They tend to breathe, blink, their expressions change. So the model is not a static thing. The model is not a statue or a photograph, so they will move around as they're supposed to do. It's important not to try to chase the pose too much, but what I mean chase is you start a painting with the head in one direction, and then the model shifts, and then you all of a sudden are changing it to the other direction, and then the model changes again, and then you're changing the head all over again. Uh, this is called chasing the pose, and you can do this if you have an extended amount of time and you like a particular pose more than the other, but for Ala Prima, it's not generally a good idea to chase the pose. So as my painting stands, I've made a rough indication of where the axis of the eyes is going to go. I made a line for the center line of the head as it is supposed to be lining up with the nose. Um, now I start very, very messy, I start loose, I start organic and free, uh, but I my main focus is to keep things as simple as possible so that I can build on top of them in future passes. So I'm using a little bit of pink onto my burnt umber mix with some viridian and cadmium orange to mix up a warm yet kind of dark tone for the cast shadow and the large shadows of the face. But at this point, I'm more focused on just the placement of the general large structure of the eye sockets relative to the nose. I'm now starting to cover the light plane of the face with just flat washes of color. So I call this the color pass, and what I'm trying to do is just cover the entire working space with color so that I can build on top of it. Now I'm trying to keep my color a little bit darker and warmer on the flesh because as I work into it I will be bringing up the color and I'll be bringing up the values and a lot of white will be used in these mixtures and white itself is a coolant and so that's why I tend to start a little bit warmer because as I continue working, things will get gradually more cool. At this stage, I'm more focused on the outside shape, the big outside shape of the head. So I'm trying to draw it out as closely as I can. And I'm pinpointing the large planes of the side of the face at, at this point and I'm doing this so that I can build the smaller features more accurately inside of them. So on my palette right now I'm mixing up a generic value scale of flesh tones ranging from cool to warm 
And I'm only doing this to create a reference for me to gauge my values and colors from as I build the true colors that I will be placing on my canvas. I'm attempting to treat the start of this painting as a sculpture, like a type of piece of clay that I'm sculpting into the basic planes of the face relative to the model that I'm looking at. And as I progress with these larger planes, I'll break them into smaller planes and subdivide them into more accurate shapes that will eventually give me the likeness of the model. As I build these large planes, I like to use a lot of paint. And this is because it's aesthetically appealing to me, but it it just it feels better to use more paint all at once. There's a quote by the great artist John Singer Sargent that said, the thicker you paint, the more it flows. When you paint from life, backgrounds can be fairly complicated, there can be many things involved, chairs, easels, people around you. So what I do to gauge the background color is I, I blur my eyes and I bounce my eyes back and forth from the model and the background. Now I know the model is not seated at the moment, but I was making large comparisons earlier on with the background and noted that it was kind of gray but it wasn't entirely gray, it was greenish relative to the face. So it was gray, yet greenish relative to the face. So that was the kind of mentality that I had in my head as I started mixing up this color. When you're painting an Alla portrait from life, try not to be intimidated by trying to capture the likeness and exact drawing and the exact features of the model in front of you as that's usually what happens at the end. And this one painting for me is more difficult because my model is my beloved girlfriend Lucy. So I don't want to get this painting to a point where it's exactly like her too early on because that will give me a tendency to overcomplicate things. Instead, I'm trying to simplify the large forms into digestible and understandable blocks of paint that I can manipulate later on in more advanced stages to give me a closer likeness to the model. I like to work from very, very general to very, very specific. Now there's many ways to go from general to specific. You can start with a very, very tight and accurate linear drawing and work the big shapes in lines and that's okay. Different artists work in different ways, uh, but for me I like working more basic shapes early on in color because I can see things more clearly with color. So in my painting, I have the general placement of the eye sockets, the nose, and the mouth very generally placed, but what I do have that I'm not going to change is the large curved structure of the face. I have the planes of the forehead, and I have the planes of the cheek curving into the side of her face. Now these are large and general shapes that I won't change, but I will draw on top of them with this burnt umber color. So I'm drawing on top of them with a burnt umber to try to get the accurate placement of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and the forehead, etc. in relation to the big shapes that I've already established.
So when I start working into the eye socket, I usually start with the eyebrows, as the eyebrows are supposed to be curving around the large structure of the eye socket. And once I have that somewhat well placed, then I will go into placing where the edges of the eyes go. This mark is indicating the tear duct relative to the nose and the mouth. And I'm going to make another mark for the other tear duct. So at this stage I've already drawn out the eyes and now I'm mixing the color for the white of the eye known as the sclera. Please know that the white of the eye is not actually white. So I've mixed up a type of purpley blue and I kind of blended it into the skin tones. It, it usually makes more sense when you mix the white of the eye or the sclera with a bit of a cooler, lighter color on top of the flesh tones. Now you can mix it warmer, it depends on the model, but in general that portion of the eye tends to be very cool relative to the skin. In an Alla Prima portrait, or any portrait in general, less is more is an idea that will work if you follow the forms very closely and if you put your marks very, very accurately on the forms. Uh, now I have a total of maybe three brush strokes to indicate the curvatures of the eyelids and I can only do this by understanding that the structure of the eyelid is curving around the eye so it's going to be getting darker and I can indicate that with just a simple brush stroke. You can spend all your time rendering that eyelid but the further you go back the less you will see so you will only see the simple structures. So now I'm mixing up some warmer colors and I'm going to be trying to build the structure of the nostril, but at this point I'm only going to be finessing the larger forms that I've already established. Once I have my canvas covered and I have my large planes in check and I've already placed my features on those large planes, I will then start to go on the features piece by piece and start to render them and sometimes push them back, meaning I'll render it and then I'll bring it back to a more simplified form if I overcomplicate things. But generally at this stage I'd like to take my time with each specific feature and render it to the exact likeness that I want to get out of this painting. I'm working on the areas above the lips and I'm noticing that the edges are actually a little bit softer and the lower portion of the upper lip is a little bit warmer relative to the bottom lip. So I'm thinking about the edge quality, edge being the division from one plane to the other plane, and I'm thinking about the relative color. And so I've just placed a mark for the top of the philtrum. The philtrum is right above the middle of the upper lip and it was sharper and it was cooler. Now I'm mixing up a warmer color yet darker to curve the outside shape of the lip into the mouth. I'm 
I'm starting to describe the curvature of the chin more accurately. So I'm placing the lighter planes or the topmost facing planes a little bit cooler and a little bit lighter relative to the areas around and that's going to help me describe the curvature of the forms. Hair can be a rather deceptive thing to paint. We don't really think about it as a object that has too much form associated to it, but if you really pay attention to the hair, there are light planes, there are dark planes, there are different individual facets that separate strands, large strands of hair. So we don't want to paint individual strands of hair. Instead, we want to paint areas such as the area below her ears that are darker because they're curving away from the light and areas that are lighter such as the ones on the bottom sides of her neck and these areas are lighter as they are facing the light more. So in mixing up the color for her shirt I'm using a little bit of alizarin crimson and cadmium red and I'm cooling it down as well as darkening it with a little bit of burnt umber. I've got the entire canvas covered and I've already painted the simple forms of the face. Now I'm going back into the eyes as I noticed that they could use a little more definition and I'm trying to build up more subtlety in the planes of the eyes. Um, it helps to stand very very far back when you're doing something like this, even the smallest little touches. Uh, because if you can put the right touches in the right place, it really makes a big difference in the quality of your painting. portraits from life. When you're in the last sitting with your model, that is the last 10 or 20 minute interval that the model will be seated in front of you, it's important to only make minor adjustments to your painting. You don't want to make any 
large and difficult changes that are going to require last minute panic. Instead, just accept and appreciate what you've got on your canvas and only make minor adjustments and make sure to stand back before you make these adjustments, as I just used my last brush stroke to restate the highlight of the nose. Thanks again for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration. If you'd like to see more of my paintings more often, follow me on Instagram under Yupari Fine Arts.